so many of us followed Rabbi Phyllis Summers' blog entitled Superman Sam, in which she chronicled her son's life, her eight-year-old son's life, from the moment he was diagnosed with leukemia. For a year and a half, we have laughed and cried and hoped until we read this post. We are so desperately heartbroken and filled with sadness. Sam has relapsed. His ninja leukemia is so very strong, it has reared its head in his bone marrow. There is no cure, there is no treatment. It's not good, it's not good. It's very, very, very bad. I type this in the middle of the night, I can't sleep. I can't think about anything except what life will be like without our Sammy. There is no cure. There is nothing we can do to cure our boy. Right after reading these words, I called my mom. Have you read the blog, she asked. She didn't need to say anything else. Like so many people around the world, we had both been reading the blog religiously. We had both kept Sam's name on our personal Misha Barak lists. I said yes, and I cannot believe it. It's simply devastating. Sam just went into remission. I thought that their nightmare was about to end. But this, this is unspeakable. My mom responded, well, maybe that will be a miracle. We can always hope for a miracle. I replied, but Rabbi Summer wrote that there isn't a treatment and there isn't a cure. My mom said, I'm still going to pray for a miracle. Superman Sam Summer, Zichrono Libracha, died only a month after the prognosis was delivered to his parents. There was no miracle. Though literally thousands of people, including myself, were praying for Sam's health, it only deteriorated. I wonder how Sam's death has spiritually affected the people who were praying for his well-being. I would imagine that the faith of some of those people has been shattered. Sadly, the spiritual turmoil often occurs in the deep recesses of our hearts. It is experienced quietly or even in silence such that we current and emerging spiritual leaders may not even know that our congregants, our students, our campers, our people are feeling this way. Just this past Shabbat, we celebrated Rosh Chodesh Adar, which means that Purim is right around the corner. As we know, God's name is absent from Megillat Esther, the story of Esther, Mordechai, and the Jews of Shushan. The rabbis of the Talmud understood that God wasn't really absent from the story, but that God was hiding God's face. Whether God was hiding or altogether absent, a curious lesson emerges just the same. It is possible to live as Jews without acknowledging God, without inviting God into our lives, our prayers, our stories, or our hearts. How can this be the case? How can Jews abandon God? I believe that many people start out from a place of complete faith in God. A God who is all-powerful. A God who will intervene in our lives on behalf of divine justice. And then, life happens. Someone gets cancer, or a relationship breaks up. A job is lost, or a miscarriage occurs. Addiction destroys a family, or financial ruin forces people out of their homes, or someone dies. Tragic events like these and so many others have the ability to shatter a person's <coughs> faith in God, so that she moves spiritually from a place of total belief in God to a place of complete disbelief in God. For she asks, how could God have let any of these tragedies occur? We know that this important question has no simple answer. And yet I fear that when life happens, we do not do enough to give the Jews whom we serve 
the tools and the space to really be Israel, to really wrestle with God. In his book titled Anatheism, Returning to God After God, the contemporary philosopher Richard Kearney claims the following. The God question keeps returning to us, compelling us to ask what we mean when we speak of God. Kearney points out that for most people, it is difficult, if not impossible, to conceptualize God once their initial faith has been broken by life. Kearney points to the hijacking of God by the religious absolutists. He claims that the postmodern response to this hijacking has become absolute secularism, or atheism. So what's a person to do when his faith has been shaken? While atheism can be a valid option in Judaism, Kearney suggests another path, which he calls anatheism. Kearney's anatheism advocates for a kind of theological reorientation after there has been a theological disorientation. Anatheism is about repetition and return. It's about reopening that space where we are free to choose between faith and non-faith. It's about the option of retrieved belief. Reorientation, however, cannot just occur in a vacuum or only once. It becomes part of a process that, must, that we must constantly work towards once we choose to orient our beliefs towards God. To me, Kearney's anatheism sounds very Jewish. Of course, we should be constantly redefining our personal relationships with and understandings of God. When life happens, we Jews should wrestle with God in the space between theism and anatheism. I wish it were that simple. This summer, I participated, along with other emerging rabbis, ministers, and priests, in the CPE chaplaincy training program. From my Christian colleagues, I learned about the notion of embodiment. Many Christians understand that God was embodied in Jesus. Therefore, my Christian counterparts expressed that they were able to know God by knowing Jesus. In the course of our many conversations, I felt a little bit jealous of them, because they personally knew God. What could I say about God with certainty? I am certain that there is only one God. But beyond that, I find my thoughts and emotions fluctuating. Sometimes I feel like God is the God of Viktor Frankl and Harold Kushner, one who is not all-powerful but could be with me in the face of pain and suffering. Other times, though, I believe in the God who spoke and the entire world came to be. And yet I find Isaac Luria's Kabbalistic God compelling as well. Perhaps God is the Ain Soph from whom everything else flows. Heschel's God of wonder and amazement resonates with me. So too does Rahel Adler's notion that we might lament to God when we find ourselves in places of suffering and pain. However, there are times when all seems right and I, like the psalmist, want to praise God as the source of goodness and justice. Sometimes God is the still small voice that Eliyahu heard, and other times God is Isaiah's God calling us to a better world. I could probably go on for days, rattling off all of the different notions that resonate with me in different moments, and I would imagine that you could each probably do the same. That is our tradition. It's our inheritance. We have to wrestle with the God whom we encounter or fail to encounter. But where and how do we wrestle with God and the darkness that life presents as individuals and as a community? I fear that collectively we do not do enough to give the Jews whom we serve the space and the tools to really wrestle with God, to really be Israel. Furthermore, I worry that we don't, and I worry that I don't personally do enough to wrestle with God. Perhaps. This has occurred because, as William James, the psychologist and philosopher, put it, Americans place a high value on happiness. And as such, we tend to adopt religious beliefs that are concurrent with our desire for happiness. So rather than lamenting God or crying out to God, it is more appealing to praise God. And when situations
situations occur which impede our ability to praise God, we usually remain silent and perhaps stop believing. The Judaism that I know has fallen into the trap of conflating religion with happiness. Think about it. Instead of learning to lament God through Eicha, we relegate Eicha to Tisha B'Av, a holiday that our movement barely acknowledges. Furthermore, the, the character of our communal prayers is often optimistic and happy. Don't get me wrong, I like happiness. I like happiness just as much as the next person. But what about when I feel depressed or anxious or afraid? What about when the next person over is going through a crisis? We, the current and emerging leaders of the Jewish community, ought to give our people the linguistic, the emotional, intellectual, and existential tools to wrestle with God. We ought to give them the space to do this. And in fact, we ought to do it for ourselves, too. Thinking back to the conversation with my mom, makes me want to have a deeper conversation with her about the way that Sam's death has shaken my faith, and perhaps hers too. It may be much easier to keep these struggles to ourselves, but when we dwell in the discomfort and engage in the wrestling match, we then have the opportunity to emerge stronger, not without wounds, but stronger nonetheless, emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually. I want to challenge each of us here at HUC to open up the conversation about the ways in which we can raise the level of discourse, learning, debate, debate prayers, and ultimately wrestling with God here and in all of our various communities. This week, we read about the great care that Aaron, the priests, and all of the Israelites took in creating the proper space and atmosphere for God. Once all of the details were explained, God declared, For there I will meet you, and there I will speak with you. And there I will meet with the Israelites, and it, the tabernacle, shall be sanctified by my presence. I will abide among the Israelites, and I will be their God. And they shall know that I, Adonai, am their God, who brought them out from the land of Egypt, that I might abide among them. I, Adonai, am their God. Just as Aaron and the priests worked to make a space to invite God in to dwell among them, so too must we make the space for God to dwell among us in the midst of our real lives. And so I pray. Elohai ve'elohei avotai ve'imotai, Elohei Luria, Elohei Frankel, Elohei Yeshayahu, Elohei Adler ve'elohei Eliyahu. My faith in you is far from certain, and my understanding of you is lacking. Yet I pray to you for the strength to wrestle. I pray that I might turn to you in times of joy, and to lament to you when the world feels unjust. I pray that you will know me, all of me, with all of my imperfections. I hope and I pray that someday I might feel as if I know you too, and so I will continue to be Israel. Can you hear that song? May it be your will.